Good morning and welcome to Hay and thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Andy Friars. I am the Sustainability Director here at Hay Festival uh, and I am responsible for the Transmission 2 project which we'll be talking about today. Um, and we run it in partnership with uh, the Natural Environment Research Council who are the UK's largest funder of independent environmental science research training and innovation, which is delivered through universities and research centers. Transmission uh, brings together scientists and artists to find new ways of communicating um, uh, cutting edge environmental science to new audiences. Um, and the first transmission project we ran two years ago, alongside NERC again, um, and that focused just on the UK. Um, and then when we, we wanted to run Transmission 2, we thought, let's look wider, let's look at some of the, uh, the research, the environmental research which is being uh, funded around the world, uh, and look at where we do festivals as well, and see if we can pair those up. So with Transmission 2, we, we looked at and we focused on, on three areas, one in Peru, which we launched yesterday, uh, one in Colombia, which we're talking about today, and one in the UK, which we'll be talking about tomorrow. Um, so um, this one here uh, in Colombia, we are we we had uh, a large number of researchers who were involved, and an artist called Juan Cardina, Cardenas. Um, he'll be joining us later on. But I'm joined live at the moment by two of the lead researchers uh, who we have collaborated with. Uh, we have firstly we have Naomi Milner. Uh, she is a senior lecturer in human geography at the University of Bristol uh, and specialises in political economic issues, including political ecology, approaches to environmental politics, food justice, community education, and environmental monitoring and digital monitoring practices. And she is actually currently writing a book about the use of drones in forest monitoring. Um, so uh, I'm sure she'd love to hear from you if you've got any feedback on that. Uh, we're also joined by Ted Fel Feldpouch, uh, who is professor at Exeter, associate professor at University of Exeter, uh, specializing, who specializes in a range of issues, including tropical forest ecology, land use change, and forest disturbance, degradation, and recovery. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for joining us uh, at Hay Festival Digital. Um, Thanks, you. You're welcome. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to start with you, Ted. I mean, we're talking um, about science taking place in Colombia, um, which obviously influenced the story which was then written later on. But so can you first of all just to set out what is the research you are doing in Colombia and, and why is it so important? Sure, thanks. Uh, so I'm principal investigator on the bioresilience project and we're studying uh, land use change, long long term land use change in Colombia. So Colombia is a it's a mega diverse region, one of the most diverse regions on the planet, uh, and it also it it ranks very high in terms of the number of <coughs> endemic species, and so those species that are found only in a given region. Uh, Colombia it's it's very diverse in in terms of its vegetation types as well, and so you've got dry forest, you savanna rainforest and then this range of montane forests from low low montane up to high montane cloud forests and above that then you have this treeless landscape called paramos and geographically because of its its position in south america there being at the that that connection between south america and north america it's had this long land use history with early uh, habitation by amerindians and so it went through these very early landscape transformations then more recently, the, uh, there, there's been this history of conflict in the region. And then in 2016, a peace accord was signed. And the expectation is that with that peace accord, there, there, there's the potential for dramatic land use changes uh, and changes in the dynamics of land use. And so for example, areas that may have been previously off limits, they now may become uh, available for deforestation and transformation to agriculture. So, so our project it sits at that interface then between these different these different components, and so we've got the paleoecology, which is the study uh, using cores from the bottom of lakes, mud from the lake, 
to study how environment and plants have changed over time. And then we look at the modern forests and how those forests interact, uh, interact with things like fire and, and the impact of people in those, in those systems. And then we look at people, how they interact with value and conserve the resources around them. And so ultimately then with this bioresilience project, we're looking to understand how long-term long disturbance over thousands of years, how that has affected these forests and how that may then impact how modern forests then respond to things like fire and also the people that are making use of those. And uh, ultimately then, uh, using this information that we've gained to, uh, to learn how we can improve conservation and management of these systems for the livelihood of people and also then the conservation of the biodiversity in these, in these systems. A bit more about Ted about the uh, the core samples. I mean, what what you if you uh, explain this to the people who are watching, you know, how does that process work, and what does it, what does it actually involve when you are uh, say when you say we take these core samples from from mud in the lakes? It sounds very easy. I suspect it's a bit more complicated. Hmm. Right. So maybe just to back up. So we. So why is it that we're taking these core samples? The um. So. Uh, we're working to understand how this long, the long-term changes in in these in the uh, in the vegetation and climate uh, may have affected these systems. And so, to understand that, then we need to go and take cores, these samples from the bottom of lakes, that will show us then the changes uh, through sedimentation that have happened over time. And so, we've got a team of researchers, paleoecologists, that will uh, that will take small inflatable rafts and take them out to different lakes in the region. And uh, so on this, they, they set a system where they have a platform and then they have a long core that can then be driven down, uh, down into the mud on the bottom of the lake. And with luck then, when you extract that core and then you open that core, and then you'll see the stratified layers that may go back thousands and thousands of years, 10,000s uh, of years. And, and within that, then you'll see layer by layer the, the deposits that have been laid down within that sample. Well, samples can then be taken back to, to a lab and then split into different depths. And those depths then will represent changes in, in vegetation over time. And so then under a microscope, the, the students and researchers can then work to identify the pollen that they find within, within those samples and look for evidence of, of past fire. And so looking for pieces of charcoal as well. And then by carrying, uh, comparing the, the pollen to a reference collection, then it's possible to reconstruct changes in the vegetation over time. And so you might find, for example, that there's been a shift in, uh, in a forest to more of a savanna-like state, uh, or you may find the, the appearance of fire within that landscape, and you may find pollen samples that indicate also that food crops began to be, uh, began to be farmed within that region. And you might find that at, at different points in time that, that there, there are switches then in that uh, in the vegetation and then we can look to see how the vegetation responds to those so if you if you find evidence of past fire for example how then does that vegetation respond what type of species colonize those areas and persist for for a period of time is there is there a reason ted why you just drill in the uh, the lakes. I mean, is it just because it's easy to go through the mud, or is that the best place to to act where, where you get the, the best records being collected? It's a, it's all about preservation of the of the records, and so I so certainly pollen we will, is, is floating throughout the air, and it's going to be, be deposited, and it falls onto leaves, and it falls onto moss, I, and it's also going to fall onto soil. But then when it, it, when it falls onto the soil, it's, it's incorporated at different rates into the soil. So we've got the, the, the mammals that are digging within the soil. And in some areas, it may, may be more, more active, or there may be deeper soil depths in some regions that, that will allow that pollen to be incorporated into deeper depths. But the key thing is with lakes, the, the, the sediments are deposited one on top of the other, and there's usually very little disturbance of those, of those sediment samples. So those lakes are really important then to have that, that long-term record of how, uh, how climate and vegetation has changed over time. Uh, it's something not so different from an ice core, for example, where you have the layers that have been laid down uh, year after year, century after century in those cores. 
Thanks, Ted. That's great. Um, just turn Naomi to you. Um, obviously, Ted, Ted focuses more on the, the sort of the, the practical, the ecology, the, the, the natural environment. Your, your work uh, involves more how the people interact with those spaces. Um, can you talk a bit about how, how your, your involvement in the project and how that um, marries up with Ted's work? Sure, thanks, Andy. So, um, yeah, I'm the Social Science Act, um, and I think that's something that makes our project really rich and distinctive because we have these different lenses coming to bear on the forest. And that's um, the several aspects to that. So on the one hand, we're working closely with communities who live in the forests where we're working. So we get to hear the people perspective uh, on what's affected their relationship with the forest, uh, in a shorter time scale, obviously the last few hundred years rather than thousands of years, but what affects their access, how they see the forest, how they use resources, if they know about conservation, and if they do know about it, what might be limitations in them implementing some of the strategies they might have thought of. And then there's also other, other aspects. Um, for example, Ted was talking about paleoecology going back thousands of years, but we've also got a part of our project that looks into the the arts that are available from the last uh, hundreds of years since the colonial, pre-colonial period. So we're able to see what the records tell us about disasters that might have affected the forest, um, how the forest has been legislated through time, how things like the colon colonialization affected this region and how some of those power relations might have lingered in the ways that um, affect who can access the forest and how. So within this project, what that means is uh, we've worked together with a team of assistants, um, people who are doing what's called ethnography, where they go and basically be in those places. Uh, we work in three main sites in the high, mid and low Andes. Um, I think we've got some photos to show you actually from the, the low Andean site, uh, which is um, called Serrania de las Quinchas. And here you can see some of uh, the ways that we've been interacting with the community. Um, Monica is in one of the pictures you just saw there. She's our postdoctoral research assistant. So she's been spending months being in these sites, getting to know people, walking around. We've run workshops with people. Um, and through that, we've got to really understand some of the dynamics that affect this area. So this area, then the lowlands, uh, where you can see some of the dense tropical forests that um, are, characterize the area. It's very high in biodiversity and there are some at-risk species located there. But one of the things we've been able to see is how complicated the process has been of uh, enacting conservation in that environment. So Serenia de Quinchas is actually a regional natural park, but through the process of being made a park, um, many people were left out of the debate, the discussions, and so on, and never got to really find out what the new rules were. So you've got local communities who are living in an area that's now a zone of protection um, where you can't do certain things anymore, but they've never really found out all those rules because of the local bureaucracies, because of the different layers of power that affect that area. It's been an area that's been historically controlled by the paramilitary, and so... Um, that also affects, in turn, what people can do now. There's some really exciting ideas for ecotourism that people have that would be run by them, but it's been a very insecure area for a long time, so it's been very difficult to implement that. So as part of our work, we've been documenting the life of the community, um, but we've also been involved in negotiating uh, with regional and national institutions, taking part in how... Um, the future planning happens and how communities are involved in some of the decisions that are getting made about the area that they live in. About the, uh, how the, um, the, the, the records from the colonial times um, married up. I mean, it, is it a good match or are you finding some discrepancies between what you're finding in the field and what the, what the actual the historical records are showing, or is it pretty much, you know, pretty spot on when it comes to to the, to, to the matching up? I think they tend to show different sides of a picture. It, so it's important to say that that's still part of the project that's ongoing. So we won't have all the results um, probably until this time next year for that part of the study. 
But where you do find overlap is around things like forest fires and and disturbances. But the archives tell you more about the why or um, how what effects that had, whereas the record tells you more what happened. So what's really interesting is is looking where there are gaps um, at, to try and understand well why why didn't that get recorded or why was it um, see, seen as something that was a a total disaster when it was actually quite a small fire or something like that but where it gets really interesting is where they do speak to each other but they tell you quite different stories um, so the paleoecologist might be looking at how long-term resilience kind of happens in waves um, and the archival project might tell you how um, power relations operate within that so you've, you've got a changing forest that in, on the one hand is uh, developing it, it is quite stable in its capacities to regenerate but you've got new rules meaning that only certain people can access it or um, it is going to only be allowed to be used by certain groups of people and also you see indigenous groups which are a very important um, part of managing the forest in some of our areas um, gradually being pushed to the edges and then it being replaced by more um, agriculture um, dairy farming and so on through time. They, um, you know, it's a common you know, phrase, you know, that history is written by the victors. Um, do you, are you finding there's any discrepancy between the, the local knowledge, um, which, you know, the local stories from the people, the indigenous people who are living in, the, in, in those areas and the historical records? Is there a correlation or is it, is it seen through different lights? I guess we're talking about a slightly different time period. So when you look, we're working with communities, you're drawing mainly on oral memory, yeah. which back as far as the people who live there do. And obviously there's usually a bit of passing down of memory, but it doesn't necessarily go back very far. Whereas the archives, we're going back hundreds of years. I think there, there does tend to be a bit of a gap, partly because who lives in these two areas, the three areas where we're working has changed dramatically through time. So, um, for example, in the higher Andean area, it was historically a Muisca area, an indigenous Muisca community. That community was slowly beaten back and there aren't really, there aren't any surviving Muisca communities today. But the memory of the Muiscas lingers in contemporary culture. So what's really interesting is that some of the campesino peasant communities who live there now would have, a hundred years ago, would not really have wanted to be identified with indigenous communities because they'd been systematically um, excluded in state policy and looked down upon. But as that memory has survived through legend, through myth, through sort of oral memory, more recently, there's been a, a tendency to, to reconnect with, to reattach to some of those memories and to associate them with doing good conservation. And that's something that international conservation has partly accidentally encouraged because we kind of have this idea of indigenous being closer to nature and so in with ecotourism initiatives and so on people are kind of cultivate looking tourists are often looking for that sense of connection to land and time so people who aren't actually indigenous are encouraged to, to look at their own history and see where the connections might be but actually it spontaneously happened as well. I think that within communities they're wanting, even if they've their own generations have been living there for less than a hundred years, they're wanting to find connections with the land that go back further. And so you do start to find that the stories reappear in new ways and are part of contemporary ideas about conservation. That's a that's a really good link then about the stories to uh, to talk about. The, the Transmission 2 project and obviously this is about bringing storytellers and scientists together to find those new ways of communicating science. Um, when you were approached to, to take part in Transmission 2, I mean you're clearly both very busy people, you've got your know, academic studies, you've got your students to teach, you've got your research to do um, and, then, and then we come along and we say you know how do you fancy working with an author to, to try and tell those new stories? Um, what was it that, that made you say yes? What was it that piqued your interest? Or was this something you've always been interested and involved with? Um, Naomi, I'll come to you first, and then Ted, if you could also respond as well. Sure. Great. Yeah, well, I was really delighted. I'm, I'm actually a writer myself 
in, in a non, with a non-academic hat on as well. And I just really welcome the opportunity to be able to work um, with someone else with a, quite a different way of seeing, a different perspective on things. It's something I've done before, it's to collaborate with artists or writers, um, because you tend to find, as you get within, within our project, within the different components, you're looking at the same thing, but bringing completely different eyes to it, and therefore showing up something quite different. And it makes a lot of sense working in Colombia, where possible we work with Colombian academics, Colombian experts, Colombian communities, and it made a lot of sense to be working with a Colombian writer who'd grown up in that context and knows some of the background that we were um, looking at when we were arriving in the communities. And it was a really exciting experience because Juan went with us on one of our field trips to Serenia de las Quinchas, and we were dialoguing all the way. So he got to see what we were doing. He got to see some of the kind of um, the biophysical scientific practices, how people do things. He got to hear and see the birds in the reserve in that area because there's a, a protected reserve um, within the community that we're working in. And we continued these dialogues, sort of teasing out some key strands and um, different ways of looking at the site. So I really welcomed that opportunity and I think it's been very enriching to our project. Great, thanks Naomi. Uh, Ted. Yeah, so we were looking for new ways to, to communicate what it is we do as a project and then when we have the results to communicate those results. This, this project is, uh, it is quite unique in that the oftentimes projects that are funded, they'll, they'll be composed of, of physical scientists or, or human uh, human scientists, but here we've got this strong link and this mix between the two. And so, so right from the start, we were looking for ways to interact in new ways, kind of break down some of the barriers that we may have previously had. Uh, and so, for me as a scientist, it's been it's been an interesting challenge. You know, we as 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 a science writer, we we have to tell stories, and so when I'm supervising my students. Uh, We've got the science questions that we're asking, and we've got lots of data that we analyze. And then, then I ask them, well, what, what story are you going to, to tell with that? So, so even though we, we, we report on science, we're still, we're still telling, telling stories. We're just telling them in very different ways. Uh, but this, this allowed us to, to really engage in a completely new way than, than what we do in, in, in the past in, communi in communicating science. And so it allowed us to, to engage with new creators. And so I'd never really worked with artists and, and, um, and, um, sci and um, uh, fiction writers as well. And it also allowed us to engage with people that we had never engaged with and we would not have been able to engage with as well unless we took on some of these new, new approaches. And, and so I, th I think this has been great then to be able to work with, with the Hay Festival and with Juan as well uh, to move this forward. That, that's, that's great. I mean, one of the um, uh, major differences between the sciences and the arts, and this is something that came up with yesterday's conversation about our Peruvian project. So Professor Gemma Wadham, who is, uh, the, was a lead scientist on that one, says that as, as a scientist, she's trained to remove all emotions. You take out all emotions from your research. You don't put anything of you in there because that might affect the data. If you if you try and interpret it in a way which is an emotion, it may affect the data. And that's you know clearly quite important when you're reporting facts. You want to report the facts. Um, and you you know, as soon as you start to color it with your own emotions and that, that can distort things. So she, she said, you know, that it's quite, it's quite interesting that the whole process of working with the artist when storytelling is about emotions, it's about how you, how you sell an idea, how you get people to engage with it. And that is through an emotional connection. So I mean, is that, I mean, clearly you, you, I mean, Naomi, clearly you're, you're, you're writing anyway, you're both writing, you're both working with students, but it, how, how do you get that balance between removing emotion from distorting the facts, but then using emotion to actually communicate the facts. Is that something you struggle with or is it something which comes naturally? Naomi, I'll, I'll go back to you first. Yeah, no, it's something that we think about a lot as social scientists, actually. Um, there is a kind of challenge to that idea of the disembodied objective observer uh, that we tend to think about a lot within the social sciences. And, and for, for us, we tend to think about ourselves as being situated observers. We're always people who bring 
a way of seeing from somewhere. And there is a bit of a danger in the way we, if we talk about science, we, if we talk about it as if we are kind of this sort of universal God character, seeing everything from above, because actually what we're doing is we're going to places and we're using instruments or techniques or tools that we've learned about through our training. And we're applying them to look at things in a particular kind of way, but we're always entangled in different websites that we visit. It's hot, it's sweaty, it's difficult, there's conflict. We have to negotiate these things to produce our science. And so I don't think necessarily that should invalidate any of the work that we do, but it's really important to have that opportunity to reflect on who am I? How did I get to be a scientist? Who am I when I arrive in Colombia with my degree from a you know, British university and so on? How can I build relationships that are more symmetrical with the communities that I'm with rather than just going in, taking knowledge and vanishing, as many people have done in the regions we're working in? So that's, that's already there as an invitation. And I think when you work with artists or write a job, it kind of is to unsettle the way we see things and invite us to see them from a point of view we haven't thought about before. That adds a, another layer to that, really, that it, it invites us to think about, well, what is the science that we're making? And in our region, that's particularly important because throughout Latin America, parts of Africa and other places in the global south, conservation doesn't always work well for people. We can have great conservation science and when it's enacted in practice and turned into rules and regulations, it can be horribly unjust or end up excluding already marginal groups from the areas they live in. So it is really important that we understand that science is situated and it has effects when we put it into practice. That's great. Ted, do you have anything to add to that from your own experience? Yes, well, from the physical science perspective, I think we're, we're a bit more removed from, from what we did with, with Wong. And so uh, the, when we report science, we, we still have a story to tell, but the, the strength of our story is based on the approach that we use, the, the questions that we ask, uh, and the analysis that we have in, in our findings. And so we do have to take this, this objective approach in, in our reporting. Uh, but as scientists, we still, I, I personally, I still feel this, this, uh, uh, this need to be able to put forward this story that can, uh, uh, that can have an impact on the way that these systems are managed. Uh, but I think it, it did present some challenges for us in terms of, in terms of working with, with Juan uh, in finding ways to, to make that connection and, uh, and to cross over from that objective work to more the, the subjective work where we could place ourselves within those environments and, and use more descriptive words to kind of talk about the things we see around us. For me as a researcher, when I'm, when I'm reporting results and are working with my students, so I, uh, so I often have to ask them to remove words or clarify, uh, clarify information that they've presented. And so if they're reporting that there's uh, a massive amount of carbon that is stored in the trees or that there was a large fire that occurred, and so I ask them, well, so when did that occur and, the, and, uh, and how large was that fire? So uh, uh, quantify that for me. And, and it's nice to work more on the creative side than with one to, to be able to, to add those adjectives back, back into it. And you can, you can leave it as it being the, this massive, this catastrophic fire, right? Uh, rather than a fire that destroyed X amount of, of area. That's great. Um, so I think it's time we, we're going to bring in Juan. I mean, unfortunately, because of the, the, the time difference, um, uh, uh, it was, it's half past four in the morning in Colombia. So um, Juan Cardenas uh, has sent us a video um, uh, of his involvement in the work. Juan Cardenas is a writer and creative writing teacher and an activist who has worked extensively with Afro-Colombian and indigenous communities, mapping all traditions, um, he has also, he's also worked with former FARC guerrillas, me, guerrilla members and community leaders to get them to tell their stories. Uh, and he has a, a strong interest in the natural environment. Um, so please, can we see um, Juan's video? Well, before going to Las Quinches, which is a place I used as a source for my story, 
um, I was very aware of the situation of the conflict that takes place in this in this area. I was aware of the history of the conflict, uh, which dates back to decades ago when the drug trafficking was established in the region and the emerald uh, extraction mining began like a hundred years ago. So it's a very complicated place with a very tragic uh, history. And as I said, I was aware, but I wasn't prepared for what I was going to find there. The people I was going to find, the bodies, the faces and the voices I was going to, to find in, the, in, this, in this place. So um, I would say um, I tried to gather as much information, I tried to gather as much stories as possible talking to all kinds of people and of course talking to the scientists which were very helpful for me in this process um, and even if I had a plan before before going to Las Quinchas all these plans just vanished once I entered the territory um, I'd said the territory just kind of um, sculpted the uh, image and the form I was going to imprint to the story. So um, I would say the territory pretty much created the story. And uh, my interaction in that case just um, was reduced to gather this, this different accounts and testimonies and everything. Um, well, normally, uh, I know science and art are shown as separated areas of human activity, but I'm not so sure about that, and I'm not so sure, especially after having this experience, uh, um, having worked very closely with, uh, with scientists. I would say, I know, I know art, uh, never uses the scientific method, but uh, even though science and art depend on looking for little details, little clues that permits us to, to see the whole picture, you know, and I, I would say this is a very common experience for both areas. So, and, and in that sense, they're not very different. And uh, I, ch I decided to choose this format of, of these letters uh, because I think that, first of all, letters are very, um, they permit you to put voices, real voices in the, um, in the, um, in the story. You know, this is how people talk. This is how people relates to each other and on the other hand I decided these letters would be written from the future and uh, so there would be a kind of a sci-fi story and uh, this is a decision I took because um, I think that science fiction is very useful for uh, ma for making diagnosis of what's happening in the present. So that's why I decided to, to, to use this science fiction letters. And um, of course, I, well, I think it's early to say this, but I really think that after this experience, uh, my writing's going to be influenced by what I've done and uh, Definitely, it's going to be influenced by the by the relationship with with the scientists and their methods, and their discourses and their procedures. Um, well, I've just tried I tried to learn as much as possible, so I hope my writing is benefited from benefits from it. So, 
Thanks a lot. So that was uh, Juan Cardenas, who was the author and writer of the story uh, um, based on the work which um, we've been talking about. Um, as he says, it's, uh, he's, he sets this story in the future. It's, uh, it's written between two, two people um, uh, writing letters backwards and forwards to each other, um, partly set in the future, but reflecting back on the science which is taking place now and the work which they're doing. Um, it's the, the story itself is 20 minutes long and is available on our uh, through our website if you go to the Hayfessel website. And we, so it's not lo it's too long to show in detail now, but we're just going to show a little clip of uh, of the story to give you a, give you a taste. And please do go once we finish this talk. Please do go and watch the whole thing on the Hay Festival website. Um, uh, can we show the clip, please? ¿Qué tienen ustedes contra el dinero bien ganado? Recuerdas cuando siendo muy niños caminábamos por el bosque juntos. ¿Recuerdas nuestros juegos? ¿Recuerdas cómo temblábamos de emoción cada vez que lográbamos ver a un tucán, a un camaleón, a una familia de micos? Así pues, ¿cómo crees que yo querría destruir la serranía? ¿Cómo puedes siquiera pensar que yo podría alinearme con alguna empresa depredadora del medio ambiente? He leído tu mensaje varias veces y noto que ya no percibes el límite entre tus pulsiones individuales y el public reportaje de la reserva. Y eso, viejo amigo, te convierte en algo parecido a un robot. Todo esto dicho con el mayor de los cariños, claro. Sabes que a lo largo y ancho del planeta se está replicando tu modelo de negocio en zonas que solían estar verdaderamente protegidas por leyes y gobiernos. Y sabes perfectamente que estas falsas reservas no han ayudado en absoluto a mitigar la destrucción total en la que vivimos desde hace casi 100 años. So that was a very brief clip. Um, so, like I say, please do go. But it gives you an idea uh, of the, the conversations between the, the, the two two protagonists in this particular story. Um, before we go to questions from the audience, Ted, Naomi, is there anything you'd like to come back on for you know, your reaction to that story when you first saw it, or the that involvement of of, of science and science fiction? Because it's it was a you know, there's clearly some some issues around around portrayal of science. Sure, yeah. I was really interested and pleased that Juan chose to use speculative science fiction for it because I think it's quite a different, difficult story to narrate uh, in a present day register or, or, or through realism. And that's partly because there are lots of different agendas at play in conservation and sometimes I think it really helps to create an imaginative fabric that's quite far away from uh, the world we live in to think through what some of the implications might be. And I'll just highlight now I think one of the, the aspects of conservation that Juan, from his experience in Colombia, wanted to highlight was the militarization of conservation in Colombia and other parts of Latin America. And what I mean by that is because the kind of language of conservation is somehow quite close to the idea of hidden enemies and uh, things we need to control to be safe and insiders and outsiders, sometimes conservation is getting used to perform other agendas sometimes where a big national park is being created apparently to protect rhinos or jaguars or whatever or forest what's actually happening is that the borders that are being made are serving a political end for example a particular group is being kept out of that area because they're seen to be a bit risky or more police or more the army are being brought into the area supposedly to protect against poachers, but actually to um, bring about a certain kind of military rule. And I think what you can see in that speculative world is some of the consequences of that for a nation and some of the, the, the places it could go to. So it's a, there's kind of a warning element in his narrative, which I think is a really important one to attend to when we're looking at um, conservation in the global sense. That's great. I think we'll probably go to Ted. Unless you have you got anything particularly you want to say, or we'll just go to questions. Well, just to note that the I, I very much agree with with one that the uh, that the process that we go through it, it shares a lot of similarities, and so uh, scientists and, and creative uh, uh, creative artists they're they're very much driven by by curiosity, right? And so the uh, and so we might have to take several approaches to try to try to develop something and different methods and so as i might i might not only look at the trees if might i have to 
to dig down into the soil uh, to study how things are changing. And in writers as well, they might have to use different approaches in, in, in the way that they present their material. So I think there's, in that process, then, there are quite a few similarities. And it was interesting to see how the, those aspects fit together to deliver this, this final product. That's great. Um, OK, so we'll, we'll try and take as many questions as we can. So um, uh, obviously, these are quite detailed questions, but um, uh, try and keep your answers reasonably uh, succinct. Uh, so we can get as many as possible. Um, so the, qu the first question is, um, what are the most effective practical actions for ordinary global citizens to take which will secure and protect the rights of indigenous peoples? Um, is it protecting the forest, restoring the forest, putting indigenous people at the heart of conservation and restoration too? Um, uh, Naomi, I'm guessing this is probably one for, for you in the sort of social sciences. Um, can you give a response, please? Well, I mean, it's a very difficult question to ask answer in a simple way because some of us are thinking about these things with our whole lives i think but i think one of the things that's important to it is implicit in the question which is understanding that there is a politics to conservation it's not just a matter of knowing what should be done and implementing it wherever you want to bring in an idea of doing something to an area there's a risk of um enacting parallelization in an exclusionary way in a violent way, in disrupting systems that have been stable for a really long time. So that's something we really need to make sure gets through when it comes to global conservation strategy and sustainable development goals and so on, that it, it's not just about an abstract idea of how to conserve the earth, it's about knowledge systems. I think we need to think about biodiversity on the same page as cultural diversity and ensure that we're not to achieve one but obliterating the other. Um, and there are a number of organisations around the world. We tend to partner a lot with organisations so that we don't reproduce some of that violence in our work. And there are a lot of organisations locally, regionally, internationally that are trying to develop that sensitive, culturally sensitive mode of thinking about biodiversity protection. And I think that's a really, land is life is one, one important example. That's a really important thing to think about so that you're, you're supporting indigenous or campesino peasant leadership in creating new strategies rather than bringing in this one size fits all model of conservation that tends to problem cause more problems than it solves it's, uh, it's, it's also just to add to that the I, I think oftentimes we underestimate the power of of the consumer and so we really can make changes as, as consumer i do research with uh with sustainable timber harvesting and when you have uh, certified timber, it, it really can change how these, uh, how these resources are managed. And some of the areas I go back to where you have a, a certified, uh, certified timber extraction, you find that that area, it's, it's the only forest that it has remained standing. And, and so here in the UK, we can, we can make the decision to purchase certified timber uh, for our work. And that, that actually does have a real, a real impact in preserving forests. I guess there's a, there's a linked question to this, which uh, which has been asked, which is how how, um, how do you ensure that you personally or your research team does not cause intended change and consequences to the groups of people that you're actually working with, either bringing disease or commercialization, causing people to want to leave their local communities? How, what sort of um, uh, things do you put in place to actually try to prevent those sorts of unintended consequences? Well, within research, social science and scientific research, we, we do what's called research ethics. So that means whenever we're trying to understand a question, we have to think through those questions of what would be the effects of um, the data we might want to create. So that includes things like how do you protect the confidentiality of the people you're working with? Um, how do you ensure it wouldn't have any unintended implications on them if their name was linked with something? Um, and But in the social sciences, and within our project, we go another stage further than that. And we're always trying to think, how can we ensure that it's a benefit for communities to participate in our research and not a problem? It's a bit different for us because we're not working with uncontacted indigenous groups or people who are not otherwise entangled in the, the modern world. The communities are rural, there is poverty, and they are somewhat disconnected in some ways from urban centres. But they already there already is traffic of people between 
these places and and cities and the rest of the world and internet and so on so there isn't that question of how might we bring something that they don't already have but there is certainly that question of how do we ensure that res mutual respect is cultivated that people have uh, findings they can use at the end of the research and that it benefits them to take part in the research. And Ted, what about from your perspective in terms of the practical side of things? So before we do any, any research, we, we, uh, we contact the local communities and then we send a small team to meet with them. And so meet with the, with the village leaders. And then we have the, this, the socialization events where, or, uh, we can meet with the with the local communities, give presentations about what we're going to do in terms of the research, uh, justify the the importance of this, and then respond to their questions as well. And only after we've done that, we've been given permission then to work in the in the forest around the community. Do we actually then bring in the larger teams, where we've got uh, teams of postdocs and and postgraduate students and technicians as well, and then also working with people from the community as well uh, to help us do the research. Great. Well, I think we've got time for one last quick question. I say a quick question. It's, a, it's quite a big one, but uh, we'll have to keep the answers reasonably quick. Um, what signs of climate change have already been evident in these ecosystems and what are the challenges uh, facing them over the coming decades? Uh, it's a big question, Ted, uh, but I think you know, can you just sort of, you know, from the, the, the evidence coming out at the moment, um, what are those signs of change which have already been evident there? We see not just in Colombia, but across the tropics, that there, there's been an increase in the in droughts in, in tropical forests, uh, an increase in fire as well, and fire associated with, with deforestation. And so we've got climate change uh, and then the interaction then with, with land use change as well. Rising temperatures are also occurring throughout the region. And we have a, had a recent paper that was just published uh, showing this, this negative impact, uh, a potential negative impact of temperature as well. So there very much is, is an impact of climate change in these areas. What, what do you think is the main, I mean, the, the main challenges just facing them? So, sorry, Naomi, do you want to come in on that? Well, I can answer your question at the same time, just to bring the people side back in. One of the things we're seeing right at the moment, which is very relevant in the post-coronavirus, well, in, in the active coronavirus moment, is that um, the, there's an unexpected impact of the pandemic on deforestation, and it's not what you might expect. I think a lot of us have been observing some of the positive effects of coronavirus on uh, the environment, and that we're able to hear the birds sing and so on. But in Colombia, the forest fire data so far, as in Brazil and other parts of the world is showing that actually there's been a dramatic increase in forest fires and deforestation because of the decrease in capacity to regulate illegal groups in those areas. So I think what, as we're coming, as we're in the post-COVID moment, we're going to be needing to think about um, how to regulate these areas to support understandings of conservation that we have already. And um, I think within the climate change moment, certainly there is a lot more. Um, prevalence of forest fires but we, we need to think about the people side and how to ensure that we're working with communities working well in regional areas to ensure that those policies get implemented in the best way they possibly could be that's great thank you uh for that um and it is interesting that uh, like you say on the on the post-covid or during the pandemic that uh, things are, aren't always um the same as, as we view from over here um I'd like to thank you both, um, Naomi and Ted, for taking part, and Juan for joining us from uh, from Colombia. Um, the Transmission Two project has been a, a you know a, been a fantastic experience, I think, for everyone involved. Um, please do go and watch the story, the full story, at our on our Hay Festival website. It's on our YouTube channel. Um, and uh, if you're able to join us tomorrow for the launch of the UK story uh, and also the, the animation which, uh, which accompanies the whole project, then please do at 10.30 tomorrow morning. Thank you so much for, for watching. Thank you, Nurk, for sponsoring this and partnering with us on this whole project. Ted and Naomi, thank you very much, and thank you for watching at home.